And a good morning to you on this Monday, July 23rd. This is The Harvest Show. My name is Drew. That's Chuck, Valerie, and Stefan. We also have standing by, I believe, on the telephone, my father, Pete Summer. Actually, he's on Skype. Uh, all the way from Palau. Dad, uh, good to see you again this morning. For folks who maybe didn't uh, catch up with your updates last week, uh, where exactly is Palau? Uh, Palau is about a thousand miles to the east of the Philippines, a thousand miles south of uh, the island of Guam, and uh, kind of out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Now, some folks may think that it's, you know, difficult to maybe operate a shortwave station that far away from our headquarters here in South Bend, Indiana. How exactly does that work? And it looks like we've just lost Pete somewhere there from <laughs> Palau, but uh, I think we have him back. Uh, Dad, I'll ask the question again. Folks may wonder, is it difficult to operate a shortwave station so far away from our headquarters here in South Bend, Indiana? How exactly does that work? Uh, we've got a terrific staff here in uh, Palau. Uh, we've got uh, six or seven Filipinos and uh, one Palauian and an American, uh, Gary Shirk, who's our chief engineer. And they do a terrific job keeping the facility operating. And uh, all of the programming actually does originate there in South Bend. Uh, in our shortwave master control. It goes via satellite to Pennsylvania, via fiber to uh, Tel Aviv, Israel. And uh, from there it goes on satellite again and is received in Palau. So it kind of takes a long way around the earth to end up here in uh, Palau, but that's, uh, that's the way it gets here. Pete, how in the world did you identify Palau as the place to set up a headquarters? Were you throwing darts one day at the map or what happened? <laughs> uh, we were actually looking for a place that would be a lot closer to China than uh, Hawaii, where we had a facility down on the Big Island for many years, but we realized that that far away, we weren't getting a good signal going into China. And uh, a station that was operated by a ministry here in Palau became available. They uh, decided they wanted to do something different other than a shortwave radio facility, and we were able to step in and purchase it from them. And it's been a terrific opportunity for us. We brought equipment from both uh, our former Noblesville facility and South Carolina facility, as well as Hawaii. And uh, we've got a great operation going. We've got four 100 kilowatt transmitters feeding three different antennas. Uh, and uh, it's, it's just absolutely a gorgeous, gorgeous operation. Tough to get to, but, but it's a gorgeous <laughs> operation. Well, Pete, last week we saw some amazing video from your GoPro uh, video camera, your new toy, and you're coming to us today live via Skype, and yet short wave. Why short wave? Why is it still so important in the wake of all of this new technology? You know, Valerie, there are still millions and millions of people who use the archaic technology of short wave radio to listen uh, to happening and things going on outside of their world and outside of their country. Uh, you know, media is very tightly controlled in a lot of countries around the world, and it's something that we enjoy in America and don't really fully understand uh, how tightly controlled media is in a lot of places. So, you know, we can broadcast the gospel freely to North Korea, to China, Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam, all the way over to Mumbai, India from uh, here in Palau. And it's an amazing thing that we're able to be able to get the gospel that far over. And uh, again, all of the information that we see says that millions and millions of people still listen to shortwave radio as one of their primary sources of information. And so we're there. It's not a dead technology by any means. And it's something we're going to continue to, uh, to work with. Uh, Pete, I remember when uh, Lassie Broadcasting first acquired the station there in Palau and the incredible increase in uh, response that we started receiving from mainland China specifically, as well as other parts in Southeast Asia. Uh, is that still uh, the case uh, with respect to the amount of people that are listening and responding to World Harvest Radio out of Palau? I believe it is, Stefan. I mean, uh, we know that the North Koreans don't like our signal and they routinely try to block it. We know that the government of Malaysia doesn't like our signal. And so we know that if governments don't care for us, that means we must be doing something right. Uh, there are several countries in Southeast Asia where owning a private shortwave radio is against the law. Uh, I mean, how controlling is that? Uh, we know that people in, uh, especially the remote areas of China, listen to shortwave radio extensively. 
Uh, of course, in Africa, shortwave radio is one of the primary ways that people receive information. And that actually is coming from our uh, South Carolina facility, not the Palau facility. So we know that uh, shortwave is very important. We know that a lot of people still listen to it. Sometimes they can't necessarily respond, but we still get Bible requests from all over the world, and especially here in Asia. And uh, Dad, it's going to be our uh, top story in the news, even though you're on the other side of the world, I know that you stay up to date with what's going on. And obviously, the tragedy in Aurora is still on everyone's mind. Fresh, uh, your thoughts on that this morning? You know, it, it has been on the news here. I've been watching actually Fox News. And uh, given the fact that uh, I'm 13 hours ahead of uh, uh, the United States, I'm seeing a lot of news that uh, in some cases people may think is old news. but. Uh, you know, it is interesting uh, to be able to see what's going on and some of the reaction. Our hearts go out to the people in Colorado, and it's really an incredible, un in incredible, horrible thing that happened there. And our prayers are certainly with all the people of uh, the families and the victims, and we pray that the people who are still in the hospital receive a miracle and are making it. Well, Dad, always good to see you. I know that you have uh, a few more stops on your journey on the way back to South Bend, so... Uh... Also remain safe and enjoy uh, the folks in Hawaii and so on and so forth. And we'll see you when you get back. Uh, guys, before we uh, wrap up our opening chat here, perhaps your thoughts on the uh, events in Aurora. Well, you know, it is a tragedy. And as Pete said, we're still praying that those people who are in the hospital receive a miracle and that mm -hmm. they will be healed. I was so glad that the focus has been taken off the alleged gunman in the media. A lot of the focus has been taken off him. And placed on the victims and the mm. survivors and the stories that are now starting to surface, Chuck. As you know, so many people were able to help other people who were wounded, you yeah. know, in the theater. So just it's going to be a time of healing. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it strikes me particularly close because my in-laws live yes, in Aurora, Colorado. Mm -hmm. And my father-in-law's office overlooks the theater where this happened. Hmm. And he says there is a tremendous feeling of shock there among the people in Aurora, and you can only imagine what it's like, uh, especially for those people who serve at the Air Force Base there in Aurora. Four of them uh, were killed in the movie theater on Friday, Tuesday night, or excuse me, Thursday night, Friday morning, uh, mm -hmm. when this yeah. all happened. Yeah. And uh, I also want to remark, too, you know, if you didn't know, our Friday show here on Harvest was taped. Mm -hmm. That would be why we didn't talk about it on Friday morning and why yeah. we're talking about it now. But as I think of all those people sitting in that theater, going out, hopefully having a good time, and it just shows that sometimes evil can't be stopped. We often ask in situations like this, where is God in this? And God gives us all free will. And unfortunately, it doesn't take everybody. It takes just one person. And kind of violating that free will uh, to kind of ruin it for a lot of other people. Mm. And, you know, there, there's not going to ever be a great explanation of why somebody has such hatred, such bitterness, such evil inside of them. But the only thing we can counter that with is love. Right. And we have to continue to love and to pray and to turn to God in times like these. Yeah, and uh, obviously a terrible tragedy. And uh, as Pete mentioned, our prayers are with the people of Aurora, yeah. the community, especially with the uh, the victims and the families. Our prayers are for those in the hospital that they would uh, get well and that the Lord would touch them. And uh, one of the things that um, I liked to, that came out of this really uh, was that there was not really a whole lot of politicizing of the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. And both mm -hmm. uh, President Barack Obama and uh, Mitt Romney uh, gave proper addresses uh, and kind of got involved but then kind of stepped back from the situation uh, to, to see this community heal and it's going to be be a while and there are a lot of questions that will remain unanswered but uh, as Chuck as you mentioned you know our our basic prayer and bottom line is that you know that the Lord would would find a way to involve himself and, uh, and bring his love to bear upon the situation uh, for all those that are there. And again just want to encourage everybody at home to keep all those folks in Denver and Aurora in your prayers and uh, we will as well here at Lacey Broadcasting and there's going to be a lot more said about this but uh, we do have a lot to come today on our show. Pastor and evangelist Gerard Long explains how a new Bible course can help you move beyond religion to a real relationship with God and Middle East correspondent Brian Bush is going to join us live later in the show with an update 
from the holy city of Jerusalem. And I'm going to start a new series today. We're going to start rethinking success in a series called Success as Failure. Don't go anywhere because the Harvest Show is just getting started. Now on this Monday, July 23rd, 2012, here's what's happening in your world. Hundreds of people attended a vigil in Aurora, Colorado Sunday evening after a shooting rampage Friday in that Denver suburb left 12 people dead and dozens more wounded. Crowds gathered for prayers and healing at the Aurora Municipal Center. The Colorado governor and the Aurora mayor were among those at the service. The governor read aloud the names of those who were killed in Friday's rampage. After each name, the audience said... We will remember. This person is not a representative of what Colorado, of who Colorado people are. The heinous, horrible act of violence is not a proper representation of the people of Aurora and the people of Colorado. I'm tired of these cowardly, dirtbag vigilantes thinking they can, you know, just run amok in our community. Authorities say they cleared dangerous materials from the apartment of 24-year-old James Holmes over the weekend after he allegedly set booby traps inside. Holmes was arrested Friday after authorities say he opened fire during a midnight screening of the Dark Knight Rises in Aurora. President Barack Obama offered his hugs, tears and the nation's sympathy to survivors of the Colorado shooting rampage and to the families of loved ones who were shot dead. Behind closed doors, Obama met one by one with hurting families gathered at a hospital and patients recovering in intensive care. He emerged and kept his focus on the fallen and survivors. I confess to them that uh, words are always inadequate in these kinds of situations, but that my main task was to serve as a representative of the entire country and let them know that we are thinking about them at this moment and will continue to think about them each and every day. The president also said the perpetrator of the massacre would feel the full force of our justice system. Unfortunately, America suffered another tragedy Sunday, this one on the highway. At least 11 people died. Another 12 were injured after a pickup truck loaded with passengers left the highway and crashed into trees in Burclair, Texas. State troopers are investigating what prompted the single vehicle crash and did not immediately know the names and ages of the victims. Six of those who died were still inside the truck when emergency crews arrived to find this mangled vehicle. Several of the survivors have life-threatening injuries. The 23 people were all traveling inside the truck's cab and bed. Two Americans and a Brit were killed over the weekend by an Afghan policeman at a training academy in western Afghanistan. The three were serving as advisors at that training facility. Afghan police officials say the gunman graduated from the police training center a year and a half ago and was assigned to the center's protection unit. He was killed after he opened fire on the civilian trainers inside a hall at the center. And it is a deadly day in Iraq where at least 82 people have been killed in a series of roadside bombs and shootings. The attacks took place in Baghdad, its suburbs, and the northern city of Kirkuk. Authorities say the attacks appear coordinated. The blast all took place within a few hours of each other and targeted mostly security forces and government officials. The violence comes days after the leader of al-Qaeda in Iraq warned that the militant group was reorganizing now that U.S. troops had left the country. This is my home, the old city of Jerusalem. Since 2002, I have been reporting live on The Harvest Show, bringing you the news and sharing my perspective on challenges facing this ancient city. Tune in for Brian's unique perspective on world events and check out his blog only on The Harvest Show.
Well, following a life-altering experience in 1980, Gerard Long has since lived his life with a burning desire to serve God. And Gerard's career includes 30 years in leadership with HSBC, one of the world's largest banks, and its present role as president of Alpha USA. And Alpha, that was a little commercial spot we saw there. Uh, good to have you with us today, Gerard. Tell us a little bit about Alpha. Let's begin with that. Well, Alpha is a practical introduction to the teachings of Jesus Christ. It's done over a 10-week period. Mm -hmm. But it's also done an environment of acceptance and love and grace. And so we find that people love to come on, on Alpha because, one, they make new friends, but also it's an environment where they can ask the big questions of life. Mm -hmm. And it's a thing that's been growing uh, tremendously in the UK and around the world. I believe it started in the UK, correct? Started in the UK as a 101 discipleship course. Um, and Nicky Gumbel, who's the current uh, founder, is in the current uh, formats in, he noticed that people were coming on the course and then they were seeing that uh, they were coming to faith in Christ. Mm -hmm. So he said, why don't we actually change it now to be for those outside the church? And that was in the early 90s. Now yeah. you have uh, quite a story. So let's go back to the beginning and kind of, you know, how you got started, uh, you know, obviously being a Christian about 32 or so years ago. Well, yeah, I, I um, was born into a, Christ, a Christian home. My parents were wonderful Christ followers, great mm -hmm. example in their marriage. Came to, to faith in Christ as a young boy. I was about five years old or so. Uh, made a genuine ask of Jesus to forgive my sins, to be my good shepherd, and to lead me in my life. And I went mm -hmm. through all the normal things that people in Christian homes do. Went to church, went to Bible study, learnt the scripture, things like that. But I noticed in my mid-teens that I really wasn't allowing Jesus to be Lord of my life. He was certainly Saviour, but He wasn't Lord. Hmm. And so uh, I came to a point where I said, well, God, if you don't mind, you go in the back seat. I want to take the steering of my life. And I went headlong into the things of the world. Particularly running track became my God. I, 800 metres was my big thing. Ended up going to the, big, the best college in the UK. Mm -hmm. Sebastian Coe, Olympic champion, was there. It was a 4 by 4 team mm -hmm. with him. Hmm. Ended wow. up being head of the, uh, of the captain of the track team. But then at 22 years old, my brother wrote to me, he'd been into the drug scene, he wrote to me and said, Gerald, I know you've got a plan for your life, but I want you to know that God's got a plan for your life made out of perfect love. And, you know, sometimes God mm -hmm. speaks to us and you can't get the words out of our minds. Well, it was February the 14th, 1980, Valentine's Day. I was sitting at my desk, there was no one else around, and I, I sensed God speak to me. And he said, you may not get the thing, if you follow me, you may not get the things on the outside that you've been after, mm. but inside I'll give you quality of life. Mm. And I got it. I got it that I, you know, it doesn't matter what's going on the outside in a sense. If you've got love and peace and joy on the inside, yeah. who's, who's better off? Yeah. So yeah. I surrendered my life to God at that point. Uh, it was like this liquid love came into my heart. It was absolutely extraordinary. I now know it was the Holy Spirit pouring God's love into me. Mm. And I fell head over heels in love with Jesus Christ. Uh, I couldn't put the Bible down. I wanted to tell my friends I was captain of the track team. Now I wanted to tell my friends that I'm now following Jesus. And I stopped swearing overnight as well. <laughs> I got into swearing a bit. <laughs> And, uh, how, was, how did everybody accept the new you? Well, they, they, the jaws dropped a little bit, you know, yeah. what's going on? But they could see that something real, they could see it was genuine. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, my, my one longing then was just that people would meet the real Jesus. Yeah. Uh, his glory would be seen. And I just longed for that. And, and my prayer was, Lord, do whatever's necessary in me that your, your kingdom would come. Mm -hmm. Now, from college, you, you continued on that kind of career path in uh, finance and banking. Uh, made a tremendous career out of that, but you also kind of co-pastored as well at the, at the same time. Yes. What, what was that like with kind of one foot in the evil world of finance, so to speak, and the other <laughs> foot in, you know, pastoring or co-pastoring a church? Well, we felt, my wife and I, Jeannie, we felt that God was leading us to, to London. And I was on an executive uh, plan through college, banking and finance degree. And we felt God leading us back in to that. And so we went to London. I was working in one of the top banks in the world but got involved with the kingdom of God in London, and involved with a, with a house church, very lively, vibrant house church. And we had some great experiences there. One, mm -hmm. we got to know Jesus more, uh, but also we saw that his promises are real and you can trust in them. So in our own personal life, uh, we were seeing God do amazing things. When I first went, we were below the bread line. So the first two years, God was doing amazing things. People were giving us gifts to make us through each month. Mm -hmm. And there was one time when Jeannie uh, didn't have any money in her purse. And one of the neighbours, uh, who wasn't a Christ follower, there's a tradition in London when they see a mother with a baby, came out and pushed a pound into her hand, and, and that was, we could get some food. So we were trusting in God's word, Philippians 4:19. Uh, my God will provide all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. And then in the city, mm -hmm. we were longing to see God's kingdom come in the middle of the financial sector in yeah. London. And so I started praying with a friend that God's kingdom would break out there. And mm. within a short space of time, many people were joining us. We had six prayer meetings wow. around central London in, in a financial district. Uh, and we saw amazing things. And 
the interesting thing was, that was Matthew 6, 33, seek first my, my kingdom and my righteousness, and everything else will follow. The more I put God first, the more I seem to get promotion in the bank. I wasn't mm. sort of seeking it. Ended up sharing a platform with Tony Blair. I was heading up the Millennium Bug, Y2K program. Mm. And where did that come from? It had to be God. I was on TV, actually quoted on the front page of USA Today. I don't know how that happened. Wow. But it was all God as we were sort of seeking first his kingdom. Yeah. He was opening up these other doors. Yeah. So kind of a follow-up to his question. I mean, did you ever, you know, feel your faith compromised, you know, working in this uh, banking industry? It, it was a choice. And I think there are three things in the workplace. One is, it, can you do it? Is it legal? Number two is fear. And that was a big giant for me was fear. And what will my colleagues think? What will my bosses think? Will it mess up my career? And there had to be a decision. I'm either going to go for Jesus and for his kingdom, or I'm trying to work for my, my life and my kingdom. Yeah. Mm. And, and I, as I go on, that giant was actually beaten down. And after a while, I was quite pleased people would get to know that I was following Jesus. Yeah. Now, uh, after about 30 years or so, uh, rising to great levels of executive leadership in HSBC, you decided to take early retirement and then just give, give it full go uh, with Alpha and with whatever the Lord would have for you. What, what was the, the catalyst for that decision? Well, we went through, I went through a period of real brokenness from 04. So from being right at the top, mm -hmm. I remember saying to my wife, Jeannie, does it get any better than this? I was over now in the US. I came over with HSBC and earning a huge, a ridiculous salary. I had a beautiful wife, three wonderful children. Uh, seeing God move with Alpha, many people come into faith in Christ. And I said to Jeannie, does it get any better than this? And then shortly after that, I sensed God spoke to me. And he basically said, I'm going to do a deep work in your life. And from that moment on, it was in 04, the wheels started to come off in my life. And mm -hmm. one thing after the other led to more and more brokenness. Um, betrayed at work, dog died, we were dog lovers. Middle of 05, my daughter was diagnosed with retinitis pigmentosa, which is a degenerative disease of the retina leading to blindness. Mm. Where did that come from? It just more brokenness. And then in November of 05, my youngest son, he was 17, beautiful, wonderful boy got involved with a bad boy at school, took a drug, and got very disorientated and very messed up inside. Mm. During that period, a girl from school um, sent him a, a, an email and said one of your ex, an ex-girlfriend, they'd just broken up, was a Wiccan, and she'd put a curse on him, and it just threw him into a tailspin. And so in, in November, the bottom of the valley was when my youngest son uh, ended up committing suicide. Oh. Mm. So utter, total brokenness. And my wife and I, we cried, we had no more tears left. Two months after that, my sister had led me to the Lord uh, in, in um, January of 06. Uh, my brother rang me up and said, get over here, she's about to pass. And I remember just collapsing on the floor in the kitchen with my, with my wife again, just, just weeping and weeping. I said, well, ask, ask her to hold on until we get over there. So we rushed over to the UK, went down, I went down to the hospice where she was just alive, her eyes were up in her head, last breaths. But just before she went, she's peering like this, her eyes are peering. And my mother's a very godly woman. She said, I know what's going on. She's seen Jesus. And then she was gone. Mm. Two months after that, my wife nearly died of a broken heart because of Alex. It just went on and on. But, you know, through that period, it's interesting, the psalmist says, it was good that I was afflicted that I might learn your decrees. Through that period, something very deep happened in my heart. And it was a vision of eternity. I just got a very, very, very vivid awareness that this life, as the scripture says, is a vapor. There's eternity to come. Yeah. And I, I believe what Jesus says. There's, there's two places we go to when we pass from this world. And so it came back to me, what are, what are we, as Christ followers, what are we doing? What are we about? What is this all about? Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to go to heaven because I was so broken. I didn't want to stick around here. Uh, Jesus said in John 14, 2, where I am that you may be also. So he seems to want me there. Why am I still here? So then I, it comes back to, uh, actually, we've got a work to do. Mm -hmm. And I say to Jeannie, let's get on with the work. When we finish the work, we can go home. Yeah. And I don't mean London. And, yeah. and, and so that was the, really the prelude, and we sensed the God leading us out of the bank. And then I had this offer to come and join Alpha, which is all about saving souls for eternity. Yeah. Wow. We're going to find out more about that story with uh, Gerard Long and the breakthrough, not only his breakthrough, but the break breakthrough back in more in a moment.
It's that time of year. The sun's out, the flowers in bloom, and the great outdoors are calling. All you need to enjoy those summer activities is that extra boost in energy. And here at Making Healthy Choices, we've got an all-natural solution, Mineral Concentrate, a fulvic acid supplement to balance your mineral deficiencies and give you that spark to enjoy your summer. Order yours by logging on today to mhclife.com, where you'll find not only great health products, but essential health tips as well on diet, exercise, and more. Log on today, mhclife.com. With your monthly gift of $30 to Feed the Hungry, you can provide daily nutritious meals to five vulnerable children who may otherwise have nothing to eat. As a partner in the Every Child, Every Day project, we will periodically send you updates and profiles of children like those you're helping through your monthly support. Children who now have hope. Children who now have a future because someone they don't even know cared enough to reach out. Call 1-888-832-6384 today and make a difference in the life of a little child. Today you can be an answer to their prayer, Lord, give us this day our daily bread. Please call right now or visit www.feedthehungry.org to help reach these little ones today with God's love and care. There's Bear Gryllis, uh, another famous adventurer, just like yourself, Gerard. Uh, he said, I did Alpha. Tell us again about Alpha. What is it? How did it start? And, and what's it all about here in the United States especially? Well, our Alpha is a practical, at its core, a practical introduction to the teaching of Jesus Christ. And it allows people from outside the church, which is where it's aimed, to come and ask the big questions. Why is there all the suffering in the world? Uh, what about the other religions? Of course, the biggest question of all, really, is what happens when I die? Mm -hmm. Or why am I here? And why, why am I here, exactly. Yeah. And so people can come in an environment of acceptance. No, there's no judgment. We're just interested in people. We just love people. Mm -hmm. And we want to hear where they are and where their journey is. How successful has it been in with respect to uh, drawing in people from outside the church into those kind of meaningful conversations? Well, since it's, it started in its current format in the early 90s, 18 million people worldwide have been through Alpha. It's in 169 countries. It's been translated into 110 languages. Mm -hmm. And here in the States, we're seeing it exploding. So in the last four years, 175% growth in the number of churches running Alpha. And that's really the, the core uh, of Alpha is the course, but actually the spin-off is it leads churches to be looking outward rather than inward. Mm -hmm. And so we're seeing from decline, churches starting to grow as we go back to the Great Commission, which is what Jesus said, go. Yeah. Instead of a come model, we have a go model. And uh, so many people in the, in the last, um, last year it's alone, 120,000 people made first or recommitments to Jesus mm -hmm. on an Alpha course here in the United States. Mm -hmm. Now what are some of the top, you know, most common you know, questions that you seem to get from people? Well, I think the biggest one of all is what about all the suffering in the world? And especially yeah. with what's happening in Colorado is a big question. You know, how can God allow something like that to happen? And so we, it's very much a Socratic teaching. We start with a meal, so it's friendship. We want to get to know people. Yeah. Jesus is a friend of sinners. Mm -hmm. And it's very much based around relationships. And then we have a, a talk. It's not a sermon, it's a talk on who is Jesus, the, the historic evidence of Jesus. Why did Jesus die? How can I be sure of my faith and Bible? It goes on and on like that. Then the last part of the course is a discussion. Mm -hmm. And it's very much Socratic teaching. So we might ask the question, what do you think about Jesus dying on the cross for you? Hmm. 
And in that environment, the group discusses, and you get people who are atheists and Buddhists or Hindus, Muslims, come into that sort of group, and people sitting in church who've got all these questions but never felt they could ask them. Right. Oh. You get tremendous discussion. And what we try and do is get out of the way and let the Holy Spirit do what only the Holy Spirit can do, which is lead people to Jesus Christ. Yeah. And that's why we see again and again from surveys, 50% of people who come on an Alpha course make a first or recommitment to Jesus. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming that they come into the course by invitation from someone in the church or whatever it may be yes. that is uh, hosting uh, this thing. How long does the course run? It's a 10-week course. Okay. And in the middle of it, we normally have a weekend away or a day away where we learn about the person of the Holy Spirit, who he is, what he does. How can I be filled? D.L. Moody had a great quote. He said, I keep on needing to be filled with the Holy Spirit because I leak. And I think we all can say that we <laughs> leak. We need God's power to be able to live out this life that God's given us yeah. and to be the people he wants us to be. And so a, that's a key part of the course. Uh, so 10 weeks, and we do it in all environments. Obviously, church, Jeannie and I did it in London for five years, three times a year, drug addicts, alcoholics, gang members we saw coming into our home, coming to faith in Jesus. But we do it in the workplace too. We How did you prisons. invite gang members into your home being... Yeah, where, do you uh, find, where do you find the folks or just, to you know, sign, you're, sign you're them up? Your guy here, you got 3 piece yeah. suit, work in HSBC, yeah. you know, Let's a go financier, find some well, drug that, dealers. That's a, that's a great question. And because I, I, I didn't, this particular guy who came in, I remember, it was, a girl, it was a girl in the church who felt God had spoken to her about what, inviting this guy. She didn't know who, but she mm. was just open. And I think that's what we want in our everyday lives, that we're open. You know, Jesus showed it with the woman at the well, Zacchaeus have a tree. Guys, in your life, you will meet people who I want you to, to ask and invite to come and meet with me. So she invited this guy to come along to this course called Alpha. She didn't know that two days before, this guy had had a dream about God. I mean, he was, he was off the charts in, sort of, in terms of brokenness. And he ended up coming on the course. Now, he didn't come to Christ that first course, but he came the second course. He'd been depressed for seven years. He hadn't worked for five years. And in the middle of that second course, he came along to church. He hadn't been to church at this stage. Came along, we gently prayed for him. And the Holy Spirit just came and he just wept, completely broken, and received Jesus as his Savior. Woke up the next morning, he was totally healed of his depression. Next day, he went out and got a, got a job, rung up his mom in Cyprus, said, Mom, I'm healed. Amazing. Now, when you <laughs> see that sort of transformation going on, yeah. You never want to move away from this. It's, this is surely what God has called us to do as Christ followers, yeah. to be about fishing for men, people who are broken, and seeing them come to meet with Jesus and be, be healed and set free. And I would imagine, you know, like you said, you worked in the banking industry for so long. Do you feel, you know, much more reward doing this work than... Oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, I love my... It was a time, my season. To yeah. be, that's great. And I had a great time. I saw friends come to meet with Jesus there, which is great. So I think vocation is a calling. You know, yeah. whether it's in banking or whether it's in the church, yeah. it doesn't matter. It's what God wants you, it's called for you to do. But I, yeah, no, I love it now. It's a sweet spot. Why am I here on earth? Is to be a fisher of men. Know Jesus more, love him more, but ultimately it's to introduce people to this thing. It's our Savior. Yes, amen. Our Savior. Uh, Gerard, we've got just about a minute left here. Tell us a little bit about the breakthrough. It's a bit of an allegory that uh, kind of tells the story of... Yeah what we're all asking. Well, the biggest question we get from churches, it's interesting, is, is how do we get more guests on our course? Which is, is sad, really, because that's what we should be about, befriending people, mm -hmm. getting to know them, not just two weeks before the course, but in our life, getting mm -hmm. to know them. So we, we wrote this as a tool to help Christ followers, to give to their friends as a gift, and say, have a read of this, and tell me what you think. And we're aiming to touch them in three, one or more of three areas. Number one, maybe there's more to life than what I'm seeing. Mm -hmm. Number two, maybe there is a heaven and a hell. Number three, maybe how I'm living my life is hurting other people. Mm. And if they're stirred in any one of those areas, it might be that they say, well, you got me to Alpha last time. I've kept on saying no, but actually, I want to come along now. Yeah. And so it's like a fishing tool that mm. gets people's interest, and then they come. We've had some great stories. One, one pastor had been praying for his brother for 25 years, and he gave him, gave him this little parable, and he came to Christ just recently which is pretty exciting. Wonderful, wonderful. And it is uh, a parable. It's, yeah. uh, it's a story that uh, will touch the hearts and make us think of some things. If you'd like to connect with Jared Long, you can go to alphausa.com or as always dot org. go... Dot org. Sorry, dot org. Alphausa.org or as always go to our website, harvest-tv.com and you'll find an easy link back to Alpha uh, through the show info uh, menu bar there. We've got Brian Bush coming up in just a moment, so stay with us.
indeed on this busy news day we didn't even have a chance to talk about what's going on in the Middle East so let's remedy that situation right now bring in our LaCie correspondent Brian Bush who joins us live from the Holy Land via Skype and Brian first of all give us an update on that tragic bus bombing last week in Belarus. Yeah. Well, sadly, it's been a weekend of uh, a very somber mood as the dead have been buried and uh, some wounded are still in hospital. Uh, the authorities are believing more and more that there was indeed a second person involved. The DNA and the eyewitness account aren't really matching up, and that's led Israel, at least a lot of people talking here, to believe that there is a second person involved, and thus the manhunt has begun. Chuck? Well, I'm sure all of this, too, raises awareness for Israel. And as a reminder that with the Olympics due to start shortly and that killing of Israeli athletes 40 years ago in Munich, there has to be a sense of trepidation for this Israeli team going to London. Well, you know, sure, in the back of their minds, I'm sure there is. But uh, they're going to be accompanied by security, uh, the Mossad. I think there's even Shin Bet involved in, in their security entourage. They were at the president's house the other day <clears throat> for their group photograph. They're focused on their athletic events. They're focused on what they've given their lives over to uh, in competing for these games at the, at the game's largest world stage. They're ready to go for it. I don't think that security is basically something that's on their mind right now, Chuck. Well, hopefully it'll be a peaceful two weeks in London. Meanwhile, it has not been peaceful, obviously, in Syria. And with fighting on Bashar Assad's doorstep in Damascus, there has to be a lot of talk about the potential day-after scenarios for Syria and the Middle East. Yeah, there sure is. And, and the, the, the fighting in Damascus continues, as it does also in Aleppo. Um, you know, this, this is a situation where we have the West saying one thing. We like what's happening. We like the progress that's being made. But on the other hand, the facts on the ground are still very shaky. Assad still has large control over the situation. It's not really what I've been hearing in the Western media, what I can tell from here in the Middle East. But you're correct, Chuck. The day after scenario is pretty gruesome because you've got a very factioned uh, collection of people in Syria. And then you've got these issues like mass weaponry, chemical weaponry, and other things that the West, and particularly people here in Israel, are worried about. Chuck? Well, and you mentioned those chemical weapons that Syria has. What would be their status in the case of a government collapse? What's the view from there in Israel? Well, you know, President Assad, as well as his father, they knew that if they ever transferred chemical weapons over to Lebanon into Hezbollah's hands, that would be the end of them. And, you know, Israel will not tolerate chemical weapons falling into the hands of Hezbollah. Now, yesterday, uh, Defense Minister Ehud Barak, uh, he hinted, he alluded to the fact that Israel is ready to uh, strike militarily to ensure that the chemical weapons wouldn't get across into Lebanon or anywhere else for that matter. Of course, the West, again, this is one of those paradoxes. Uh, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton alluding to the fact that she's pleased that the Syrian rebels will, uh, that they've come up with a team of experts, so to say, uh, who will handle the chemical weaponry. You know, th that's just not good enough for the people here in Israel. They're ready to take military action if and when President Assad falls. Chuck? Definitely some tense times. Prayers are needed, and hopefully the people watching this will respond. Brian, thank you very much for keeping us up to date. That's Brian Bush with a live report from Jerusalem. A reminder that Brian updates his blog on the days that he doesn't join us here on The Harvest Show, those would be Tuesday and Friday. You can access that blog at harvest-tv.com. The Harvest Show continues after this. Many Christian ministries have desired to bring the gospel of Jesus to Israel, to proclaim his message of God's love to the villages and streets he walked while on this earth. Yet only one Christian network has been broadcasting the message of God's love to Israel for more than 10 years. By God's grace, LaCie Broadcasting has been bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ and the voices of many American ministries to every home in Israel via Middle East television. You can help this great work by becoming a partner in faith for as little as $25 a month. Call today. This is the uh, birthplace of uh, Christianity. 
and I wanted to come to experience uh, this uh, history firsthand. It's deepening the meaning of the Bible now. It's not a place. It's, I've been there, I've seen this. Every new day brings new experiences, and we've been to places that we've read about in the Bible, we've heard about, you know, preached about, and uh, it, we are there, and it's amazing. This experience has changed my life dramatically. I think when I get back home, I'm going to be a totally different person. Just the reality that, um, you know, we were where Christ was. We had the best air flight we have been catered to here. It's been wonderful. It's been a joy, and I hope to come back someday. I think a trip like this, you can't put a value on. It, it, it was worth everything and more. It really was. I had to want to come back. I hope I can come back. Would you like to have a secure source of income for the rest of your life? What if that income was set and would never change no matter what the economy does? And at the same time, what if you knew you were changing lives for Jesus? That's right, it's a charitable gift annuity, the amazing part investment and part gift that never stops giving. The rates are much higher than savings accounts or certificates of deposit. It's the perfect way to honor God with your finances and fulfill the Great Commission. If you are over 49 and a half years old and you have at least $5,000, you may qualify. Call us at 1-866-224-2087 or go online to lacy.com and click on Leave a Legacy. This hard to believe opportunity won't last forever, so call while the rates of return are still high. Do it today. And welcome back to The Harvest Show, where today we're going to begin an open-ended series titled Success as Failure, which is going to build off a message that I gave last week, which was titled Overcoming Repression. Today I want to recap some of that message, and hopefully by the end of the week we're going to have circled all the way back around to where we started. Now, if I could sum up the title of this series, Success as Failure, as briefly as possible, I would say success, in a Christian sense, should be and is the exact opposite of how wider society defines success in a standard sense, like, say, the winner of the Super Bowl or maybe a wealthy CEO or pop star and so on. In Christianity, in order to be a success, one must always move through its negative, which is obviously failure. In other words, in society's eyes, what Christ calls a success is a failure. In Christ's eyes, what we call failure is actually success. Last week, we discussed how repression will always produce the thing it tries to repress. The example we gave is a very simple one. The child who is explicitly told not to have a cookie will eat a cookie as soon as the adult leaves the room, right? Of course, Paul confirms this in Romans chapter 7. We read it last week. Let's read it again. Let's start in verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sinful? Certainly not. Nevertheless, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, you shall not covet. Verse 8. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of coveting. For apart from the law, sin is dead. Verse 9. Once I was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. Verse 10. I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. Verse 11. For sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, deceived me, and through the commandment put me to death. Verse 12. So then, the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, righteous, and good. Verse 13. Did that which is good then become death to me? By no means. Nevertheless, in order that sin might be recognized as sin, it used what is good to bring about my death, so that through the commandment sin might become utterly sinful. However, this doesn't mean that we are completely free from the law now. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus never, you could say, sublated the law. In fact, he introduced new commands that even far surpassed the law by forcing us to internalize the law. How did he do this? Well, instead of don't murder, now it's don't even be angry. Instead of don't commit adultery, now it's don't even think impure thoughts. Instead of don't break your oaths, don't even swear in the first place. 
Instead of eye for eye and tooth for tooth, now it's don't resist an evil person. Instead of love your neighbor, hate your enemy, now it's love and pray for your enemies, and so on. Of course, as we all know, to live up to the standard is absolutely impossible for all of us. So to simply go around preaching the ethics of Jesus is pointless because no one will ever live up to these standards. So what do we do? Do we simply dismiss the teachings of Jesus altogether and just, you know, live under grace or whatever? Not exactly. Even though none of us will live up to these standards, we need them precisely so that we will never live up to them. Yes, of course, we all must do our very best to live as Jesus lived, loving and forgiving our enemies, caring for the poor, embracing nonviolence, and so on. But this isn't enough. The ethics of Jesus must go hand in hand with the grace and mercy of Jesus because you, you cannot have one without the other. With only the repression of the law, we're going to forever fail, passing into further repression as we're overcome with anxiety and guilt for our transgressions. However, the grace of Christ alone, without the ethical framework to support it, that doesn't work either because this is nothing more than just a license to go out and live as a hedonistic narcissist. So we need both. We need the ethics of Christ along with the grace of Christ. In other words, we need the failure of the law to accept the mercy Christ offers us. The example I gave last week, I think, fits this very nicely. If we go in chronological order through the Gospels, as they appear in the New Testament, Jesus spoke out against adultery long before we reach our story in John chapter 8, where a woman is caught in the very act of adultery. Of course, what did the law say? It says she must be put to death. But what did Jesus say when asked what to do with this woman? Let's read it. It's in John chapter 8. Like I said, let's start in verse 7. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Verse 8. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Verse 9. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones, you could say probably the wiser ones, went first until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Verse 10, Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Speaking of her accusers. Has no one condemned you? Verse 11, No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. So here Jesus doesn't stone her, but he doesn't let her off the hook either. The law created a failure through which it succeeded. Only per a transgression of the law was Jesus' grace possible. The love and mercy of grace transcended the law and it transcended the failure of the law. However, and this is very, very important, the law is necessary. We need the failure of the law to get to its success. Why? Because the failure of the law is its success. The paradox here is that even though we're not under the law, we need it to arrive at the conclusion that we are no longer under it. We have here what you could call a double negation or negation of negation. We're going to be talking about this for the next couple weeks. The law negated in the transgression of the law, which the law itself produced. However, the transgression is also negated in the grace of Christ. That's what we have, what you could call a dialectical negation of negation. Both moves are necessary. The law succeeds in its failure, which is why the story ends with a very positive affirmation. What does Jesus say? Go now and leave your life of sin. We'll be right back. On the Lucy Broadcasting Network, we enjoy the pleasure of sharing God's love on a daily basis through a variety of ministry programming. It is our hope that this programming touches every person's heart, changes every life, and that today, the lost have the chance to become a new person in Christ. The dedicated men and women who share in this calling of the gospel need to hear from you. So why not take a moment to write or email them about the impact of their ministry on your life? Your words of encouragement could be the reason others have the opportunity to accept Christ. 
In God We Still Trust is a mini book filled with information and inspiration on the amazing influence the Bible has had on the fabric of our nation's history. During the month of July, it's our free gift to you. The book is filled with quotes and prayers from our nation's most famous leaders, prayers of Washington, Lincoln, and Reagan, to name a few. It'll be yours free. Just call the number on your screen. The Bible says that man should always pray and not faint. And here in the Sea Broadcasting Prayer Line, prayer goes up from this place 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So if you're in need of prayer or you need us to agree with you in prayer or if you have a praise report, give us a call at 1-800-365-3732. And now, Patty, I couldn't wait to get in here in Prayer Line because I was anxious to find out if we've had any prayer requests concerning the situation in Colorado. Yes, we have. Mm -hmm. And you know, um, many of you watching right now are from Colorado. We get a lot of calls from Colorado on yes, a regular we do. basis. Yes, we do. And so we're very connected and attached to you. Mm -hmm. And so yes, of course we have been getting calls. The one I brought today is Will from Colorado. He's praying for his state, the families of those who are killed, and the healing of those who are injured. And of course, that's our prayer for them too. And let's pray for them first this morning yes. and then we'll get on with our others. Okay. 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 Well, Father, Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we lift up these dear families, Lord, yes, who Lord. are experiencing this loss today. Those that have been killed for the families, those that have been injured for their healing, Father God, we pray your hand to be upon them. Yes. We proclaim that Jesus is Lord over Colorado. We just thank yes. you, Father God, that your hand is moving on your children there. Thank you, Father. Lord, we know that somehow this is going to turn from your good. It doesn't seem possible when we say yes. that, but we know that's your word, Father God. So we pray, Lord, that many will be brought to the kingdom through this, Father. Yes, Father. And we pray today, God, for you to start taking these dear people and showing them the truth of your word, giving them comfort and hope in the middle of this. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You know, the okay. Bible says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide in the shadows of the Almighty. And you know, I can't think of a better time where, you know, circumstances will either push us there or will either, you know, we go there willingly, but we can find protection and safety mm -hmm. and assurance and confidence when we trust in Him. Pat. Yes, yes, absolutely. Let me just share a couple of more of these because okay. we probably won't have time to pray, but we know that you will, and you're so faithful about that. Thank you. We have Ann from Wisconsin who is experiencing depression. As Ashley from yes. North Carolina. She lost her ID. That's a big deal if it's yeah. your ID. Louise from Indiana being abused by her husband. Mm. Helen from Louisiana not keeping good company and is now addicted to drugs. Linda from Indiana overwhelmed by her finances. It's out of control. Lois from Wisconsin called for prayer for her son to find a place to live. He was in desperate need. Mm -hmm. Called back to say, found. And so he's in, in good shape here. And Hannah from New York, emotional healings from a breakup of fiance over three years. So we know mm -hmm. that she's hurting and, and we're praying for her. And you know, although we prayed for the people in Colorado and weren't able to pray specifically just right now. Just know that prayer, we specifically pray for each prayer yes. request that comes in so you can rest assured that we are reaching heaven on your behalf. And you can give us a call at 1-800-365-3732 if you'd like for us to pray and agree with you in, uh, in prayer that God would bless you and meet your Amen. needs. And now back to the studio with Stephan and Drew. Thank you so much. Drew, wanted to ask you here, yeah. dialectical negation of negation. Those yes. words stood out. Well, and tomorrow, and I know, you know, some folks may, you know, get frustrated right off the bat. Don't get frustrated. We're going to go through this over the next couple of weeks. Tomorrow, I'm really going to, you know, flush out what this means. At the core of, and, you know, sometimes we just throw out fancy words, you know, just kind of ignore those if, you know, if you don't want to get into all that. The point that I'm going to try and make the argument I'm going to try to present over the next week or so is that just like we've been talking about if our idea of success looks just like everyone else's mm -hmm. idea of success whether it's a government or a business right. or what have you a sports team if success looks exactly the same then I think we need to rethink it because everything that Jesus did wasn't a witness to success in the way that we define it in a right. standard sense it was yeah. it was just the opposite and I think that's really the, the heart of what I'm saying. There's maybe a few fancy words in there, but yeah. yeah. So really, uh, at the time of Jesus' life, anyone looking from the outside, from the religious world, 
or from the, uh, the political world mm -hmm. or from the economic world would look and say, you know, this guy's, he's really not amounting to much, is well, he? Well, and you know, what's great about Jesus is that, and again, this is something that we're gonna talk about. If you think about the majority of the people that he talked to, these impoverished people in the Galilee area, that's where he did, you know, the majority of his ministry. Yeah, for him, what he said was good news. Yeah, it was absolutely good news. <laughs> but for the establishment, for the people who, you know, had a little something to lose, what he had to say was actually pretty terrible. Right. And I think that we need to kind of remember, especially, in this country, one of the richest nations in the history of the world, mm -hmm. what Jesus said should be a huge, huge challenge for us. I mean, what he says challenges, myself included, mm -hmm. you know, the very core of who we are and what we deem important. And I think mm -hmm. we, we always have to keep that in mind. And that's really the, the heart of this message. Yeah. Like I said, let's kind of, let's rethink some things of, this doesn't mean that you can't be a success, but it means that if you're defining it in the standard sense that society defines it, you're off base as far as Christ is concerned. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So that's going to be going, coming up the rest of this All week? All this week. And it's open-ended. We'll it'll it'll it probably goes. take a, a couple weeks, but we'll see how it goes. We'll get into dialectical tomorrow. All right. <laughs> wonderful. Well, I want to encourage you today, as Valerie mentioned, and as Patty is there in our prayer line as well, our prayer lines are open. The number, as you see on your screen, 1-800-365-3732. Would love to hear from you today. And if you want to make a comment on The Harvest Show, something you saw here, a question you might have, you can always email us as well live at lacy.com. Our prayer line is prayer at lacy.com for your prayer requests. Thank you for joining us on Harvest today. We'll see you tomorrow. Looking for a fresh new way to start your day? Get started with The Harvest Show, a live talk show that offers a dose of inspiration, hot topics, news, and live reports from Jerusalem. Every day, Drew, Stefan, Valerie, and Chuck keep you on the cutting edge of what the Holy Spirit is doing with life-changing stories, lifestyle segments, entertainment, and more. Catch The Harvest Show weekdays on LaCie Broadcasting and on the web at harvest-tv.com. When you become a partner in faith with a monthly contribution to LaCie Broadcasting, you participate with us in sharing the good news of Jesus Christ through Prayer Line, International Shortwave Radio, Middle East Television, Spread the Word Bible Distributions, World Harvest Television on Direct TV, LaCie's local Christian television stations, and much more. If you're not yet a part of this effort of spreading the Great Commission to the ends of the earth, Consider becoming a partner in faith today with LaCie Broadcasting. Call the number 1-800-365-3732 or visit the partnerinfaith.com website on the screen. You can join hands with us for as little as $25 a month. Please do it today and know that in doing so, you become a vital part of this ministry and reap the benefits of partnership. The Harvest Show is produced by LaCie Broadcasting and is viewer supported by people just like you. Thank you for inviting us into your home today.